In this video, we will drive kinematics equations. I want to start up with the motion graphs so that we can ground our discussion on some conceptual basis. Let me start up with the position graphs on the left, moving on to velocity and acceleration. And these are, of course, all functions of time. So a particular example of motion graph might look like this position. And I guess actually that's it. For me to now draw velocity and acceleration, I'm now constrained by what my position looks like. So if uh, this expresses my position as a function of time, then I have to stick with the definition of velocity, which says that velocity is the time derivative of position. And for acceleration, I have to stick with the definition that says acceleration is the time derivative of velocity. And you might remember all this from your calculus class. So the derivative is graphically represented by the slope of the graph. So I find here where the slope is zero, horizontal, then that would be the point where velocity is zero. And I look to the right, I see that slope is getting more and more positive as time goes. So I plot out velocity that gets more and more positive each moment in time. And to the left of that, or earlier time before when velocity was zero, the slope is negative, downward sloping. So I also plot out ever more downward sloping velocities to the left of that point where velocity is zero. And if the position curve is actually a parabola, then velocity curve looks like this, a straight line. So when you look at the velocity graph, you see that it has this constant upward slope. So it's a positive slope that has constant value at these different points in time and that represents acceleration, the time derivative of velocity. So this is one of the first things you learn in calculus and how to relate graphs of a function with its derivative. So hopefully this uh, feels familiar enough. And now what I want to do is go the other way, backward. Starting from acceleration, I want to work out what is the velocity and what is the position. So instead of an ending point here, our starting point is going to be this, that the acceleration is at some constant value a naught. Um, let me move this axis around a little bit so that I can plot more easily going the other way. All right, this is a little bit better. It's uh, nice to think of your motion starting at when time equals zero and working out what happens as time advances into the future. So we have constant acceleration and what we want to do is we want to build out what the velocity and position will be based on the fact that we have constant acceleration and the definitions of velocity and position. So from your calculus class, you know that if your acceleration is related to the velocity through the derivative, then the reverse relationship is the antiderivative. That is, the velocity is the time integral of acceleration. But what does this mean? What the integral means is in one simple phrase, area under the curve. So if we are looking at velocity at these three different times, t1, t2, and t, then to find the velocity, we look at the area under the curve up to the time t1. And then we look at the area under the curve up to the time t2. And then later on at time t, we look at the area under the curve up to the time t. Now, I hope as you look at this, 
that something doesn't quite fit it with what you saw at the beginning. Didn't our velocity start out negative? How does that fit with this description? That the velocity represents area under the curve. Area is always positive. So this is where I have to be careful. And this is the reason I want you to cover kinematics equation derivation the way I will cover it now. So it's a little sloppy to simply write that velocity is the integral of acceleration. How is it sloppy? Well, there are a few things that are left unspecified. In calculus class, you see them in terms of integration constant. Um, the integration that you don't decide doesn't define function v uniquely. It defines it up to a constant. And then you have to put in the constant later. This is the idea I want to introduce. In physics, almost all the integration we do are done as definite integrals. So instead of uh, leaving loose ends hanging, I am going to specify what my integration limits are. The integration with respect to time t, that's my x-axis here, it's going to go from t equals 0 to the final time is, oh, I need to make sure I don't use the same letter. Let me just call this t sub f, and I'll replace that with a t later on. And I hope that these limits will start to highlight and cause you to start thinking in terms of two endpoints, the initial and the final endpoints, which means there is some initial velocity that you should be thinking of, and there's some final velocity that you should be thinking of. So this equation here is sloppy because I wrote the left-hand side as simply v. What it really is, is change in v. Or final velocity minus the initial velocity. OK, let's uh, um, finish this calculation and we can show the graphical interpretation above. Our acceleration a is constant, so the integral on the right-hand side is simple. Here, we do use the antiderivative to find the, well, integral. <laughs> so the antiderivative of a constant function is the constant times the, the variable of integration. And this is the definite part of the definite integral. You evaluate it at the two limits, the upper limit, t final, and the lower limit, t equals 0. So plugging those limits in, you get ATF minus A times 0. This is the definite integral process you learned in your calculus class. And I want you to get into the habit of using this a lot more than you are used to using it in your calculus class. So we have this left-hand side here and this right-hand side here. Uh, let's solve this for the final velocity. Then the final velocity is equal to v naught plus acceleration times the final time. And as in your textbook, by convention, we get rid of that f subscript. So this is the, one of the kinematics equations for velocity under constant acceleration. You start out as some um, initial velocity, and the acceleration changes the velocity as a linear function of time. And this shows where the negative value of velocity came from. The initial velocity was simply negative. So what that means is at time equals 0, we start out as a negative value of velocity. <laughs> and what this area under the curve represents is the change in velocity. So from time equals 0 to time equals t1, the velocity changes by the amount of area here. So 
let me just scale it so that that brings the velocity to zero. And in the additional time from T1 to T2, the velocity continues to change by amount of area here. So let me continue drawing straight line. And from T2 to the final time T, the velocity continues to change by the amount of this area here. So that's the velocity graph. And depending on what the initial value of the velocity is, now where it gets uh, interesting and where I want you to put in the effort now to gain the conceptual understanding of is the next step going from the velocity to position. So the velocity is the time derivative of position. So that means sloppily stated like before that position in some sense is the time integral of velocity. And we can go as far as to say that this is related to area under the curve. Now before with the area under the constant function curve, that area was the same size for the same time interval. So you could see that the amount of change in the velocity that should undergo is the same amount. There's where we got the linear function. Where we now have to be careful is that when you look at the area under the curve, from T1 to T2, for example, that this amount of area is different from the area under the curve from T2 to T, this trapezoidal area. And if all you are interested in was answer, then we can work out the geometry, you know, do base times height divided by two, uh, sum of two bases times height divided by two, you know how to do the geometry. But I wanted to use this uh, as an example of picture of things to come. And uh, this is how we are going to handle the, the question of area under the curve, where the curve is not constant. Here, the conceptual procedure is this. Instead of trying to take the entire large chunk of the interval, you have to think of dividing this interval into tiny little infinitesimal pieces. And the way the area under the curve is represented and calculated are the areas of these tiny little bars. So when you look at the area here, for example, what that area will be is the sum of the value of the function, so I guess here that's a v, that gives you the height at each of these points. I could call that v sub i times the size of the interval. Let's call that delta t. And we are adding up all these intervals. So i goes from 1 to n or something like that. Hopefully all this sounds somewhat familiar. This is something that you would have seen in Calculus 1 and they have a name for it. They call this Riemann sum. You have seen all this before. So why am I going through this painstaking description? Um, I want you to file this away and keep this in mind as we talk about forces and rotational inertia later. This approach of taking a large interval that we don't know quite how to handle and breaking it into infinitesimal pieces, handling each infinitesimal piece, and then adding it all up together, uh, which is most conceptually easily represented as a Riemann sum. And recognizing that when you take the limit of the size of the interval going to zero, that that becomes this integral. That's going to become a very 
common and very familiar approach. So let's uh, finish the derivation here. So to drive the position as a function of time, we do the same thing as before. So that's going to be integral of velocity as a function of time. This time it's not constant. And you integrate it over a definite interval from time equals zero to some final time. And we can plug in the expression that we derived into this integrand since we need an explicit form to actually do the integral. This is a polynomial integral. We know how to do it. The antiderivative is v naught times t plus, oh, that's uh, linear, so it's going to be 1 half a t squared. That's the antiderivative. And to double check and make sure that you didn't make mistakes, in your head, you should think of taking the derivative of this. When you do that, you get the power of the polynomial that comes down, cancels it with 1 half, so you get a t back. Good. Let's plug in the limits for the definite integral. The time goes from 0 to the final time, t final. So that's equal to uh, Plugging in t final, v naught t final plus one half a t final squared. And when I plug in zero, I'm going to get zero for both terms, so nothing. And don't forget, the left hand side isn't actually x when you do it this way, it's the change in x. So what it should be is x final minus x initial. Take this left hand side and this right hand side. Solve it for x final. And for presentation, get rid of this final subscript. And that's the kinematics formula for the position as a function of time. And you can see that you get a parabola potentially with some offset along the x and uh, y directions or the horizontal which is the t-axis and the vertical which is the x-axis and in the graph that we studied out this derivation with it looked something like this but all this would depend on what is the initial velocity initial position but what I want you to observe and take away from this third derivation of kinematics equations is this use of definite integrals you are going to be seeing this a lot and I'll point this out again when we get to forces and rotational inertia which are the other two topics where you are going to be using integration as a problem solving technique more so than in other parts of this class. So that's all. Until next time. Bye.